There was a time when you just could not be gay. Publicly, anyway. Even the merest hint of alternate sexuality could mean career suicide, especially with entertainers for some reason. For example, in 1895, the famous English playwright Oscar Wilde was put on trial for homosexual practices. He was found guilty and sentenced to two years in jail. He never recovered from the ordeal, and he died soon after his release. In 1959, Liberace, the famous pianist, sued the London Daily Mirror for libel for implying that he was gay. It went to trial, and on the stand and under oath, Liberace stated that, and this is 1959, remember, that he had never indulged in homosexual practices. The judge believed him, and he won $24,000. But then, in 1982, a former male bodyguard sued him for palimony, and this time Liberace had to pay out $95,000. Finally, in 1987, he died of AIDS, and the Daily Mirror came calling, looking for a refund of their $24,000. Hey, and look at Elton John. Despite the fact that he married a woman in 1984, the rumors of his homo and bisexuality helped erode his fan base in the late 1970s. It took years for his career to recover. When you put everything into this kind of context, you can see how far things have come today. If someone comes out, this admission is greeted by... Well, a shrug, really. But it wasn't always this way, including in the world of New Rock, which was supposed to be so progressive and liberal and tolerant. Really? Well, absolutely. These are the gay pioneers of New Rock. Now, the ongoing history of new music. is a Tory MP. Sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Hey. Sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. The pictures of naked young women are best in the news of the screws and the popular press. They plastered their pages with bingo and tits Then add all the scandal and slander that fits The women of Greenham they smeared and despised They crucify Elton with sneering and lies If it's paedophile teachers and lesbian nuns If it's filthy and fiction it's all there in the sun Sing if you're happy that way Hey, sing if you're glad to be gay Sing if you're happy that way Now there's a cancer to blame on the gays It's brutal and fatal and slowly invades The moral majority like it a lot Cause it's the wages of sin and the judgment of God the medics are baffled and caught on the run They say it's a nightmare that's barely begun When government spending is barely a joke Cause saving gay lives doesn't win any votes So try and sing if you're glad to be gay Sing if you're happy that way Hey, sing if you're glad to be gay Sing if you're happy that way And sit back and watch as they seize all our books And treat us like lepers and sinners and crooks 
Just hope you don't get caught up in the raids Or pick up a pig or a partner with AIDS Lie to your workmates and lie to your folks Put down the clones and tell lesbian jokes Forget the aggression from everywhere else While we still do a wonderful job Oppressing ourselves That's Tom Robinson with his gay anthem from 1977. Singing something like, glad to be gay back then was an unbelievably radical and risky thing to do. But if there's one thing that Tom hated, it was hypocrisy. And he felt that there were certain things about society that were worth bringing to the surface. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and let me start by posing this question. You know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What do the following people have in common? Tchaikovsky, Handel, Schubert... George Gershwin, Beatles manager Brian Epstein, Freddie Mercury of Queen, B-52 singer Fred Schneider, Morrissey, punk legend Bob Mould, and Michael Stipe of R.E.M. Answer? Well, they're all gay, or at very least bisexual. Some have kept that very, very private, some were very public, and a few have kept everyone guessing. Music can be a very powerful thing, and over the last 50 years it's been proven again and again that you can change the world with rock and roll. Rock has been used to spread political and social messages. It's been used to enlighten, to educate, and to motivate. Gay musicians have not only played a big part in breaking down barriers faced by gays everywhere, but a number of high-profile and highly influential alt-rock pioneers have been gay, too. And that's what this show is all about, recognizing the contribution and sacrifices made by various gay musicians. All right, here's another question. Who was the first rocker to come out of the closet. It's quite possibly this guy. Little Richard was not only one of the first rock and roll stars, but he was also one of the first black rock and roll stars. But in 1957, right in the middle of a tour of Australia, he had a crisis of faith after, in his words, dreaming of his own damnation, much of which had to do with his gayness. He quit the music business for five years, and he never really recovered the heights that he enjoyed in the middle 1950s. The next major coming out was with David Bowie in 1972. He had been attracting sporadic attention for his appearance in effeminate ways since 1964 when he appeared on a British TV show defending the right of a man to have long hair. He was the spokesman for an organization known as the International League for the Preservation of Animal Filament. Then, in 1970, a lot of people kind of freaked out when a long-haired Bowie appeared on the cover of an album called The Man Who Sold the World, wearing a long, flowing, blue dress, a man's dress, according to Bowie. To this point, this was the most feminized rock star image in the world. Some stores were so outraged at this that they refused to stock the album. The record also didn't sell very well. In fact, Bowie moved less than 1,500 copies of The Man Who Sold the World in America between November of 1970 and June of 1971, mainly because of that dress. Such was the state of the world back then, but the best was yet to come. In January 1970, Bowie became one of the first pop stars to be interviewed by a gay magazine, a publication called Jeremy. The interview had nothing to do with his sexuality, but the very fact that he appeared in a gay magazine was pretty radical. But then two years later, January 22nd, 1972 to be exact, he gave an interview to the NME, Britain's big music tabloid. Let me quote, Bowie said, I'm gay, 
and I always have been. Now, in reality, it was a publicity stunt, but the effect of those seven words was incalculable. Homosexuality had been officially illegal in Britain and Wales as late as 1967, and for a major pop star to utter those words gave hope to closeted gays across the UK. Bowie's Ziggy Stardust character also offered hope. Ziggy was this weirdly androgynous, kind of sort of bisexual creature who wore makeup and glitter and did all kinds of lewd things on stage, like, uh, oh, I don't know, simulating oral sex on his guitarist, Mick Ronson. Now, of course, Bowie wasn't gay and never had been, but that didn't matter. But still, after January 1972, nothing was ever really the same. So there's David Bowie, the world's first proudly, openly gay rock star. Well, not really. Like I said, it was a publicity stunt. And the same thing might, might also be said of Lou Reed. We should talk about him. Through the late 60s and early 1970s, Lou was the leader of the Velvet Underground, which might have been the world's first true alternative band. A lot of their songs were pretty kinky, delving into some pretty weird sex and drugs and rock and roll. By 1972, Lou had gone solo and very, very glam. He started wearing more S&M leather gear. He bleached his hair blonde, and he began wearing black fingernail polish. And even though he married a woman in 1973, many people presumed that his gayness was the real thing, especially after he had this hit song about a couple of friends of his. 
a couple of real life gay transsexuals. Holly came from Miami, FLA. Hitchhiked away across USA. Plucked her eyebrows on the way, shaved her legs, and then he was a she. She says, Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. Said, Hey, honey, take a walk on the wild side. Candy came from out on the island. In the back room, she was everybody's darling. But she never lost her head, even when she was given head. She says, Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. Said, Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. And the colored girls go do 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 Gave it away. Everybody had to pay and pay. A hustle here and a hustle there. New York City is the place where they said, Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. I said, Hey, Joe, take a walk on the wild side. Sugar Plum Fairy came and hit the streets Looking for soul food and a place to eat Went to the Apollo, you should have seen him go, go, go They said, hey sugar, take a walk on the wild side I said, hey babe, take a walk on the wild side All right Ha! Huh. Jackie is just speeding away Thought she was James Dean for a day Then I guess she had to crash Valium would have helped that fashion I said, hey babe, take a walk on the wild side I said, hey honey, take a walk on the wild side And the colored girls say Do, 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 do Now, a quick note about Lou Reed. When he was in his teens, his parents, very conservative parents, were quite alarmed at what they thought were homosexual tendencies. So you know what they did? They sent 17-year-old Lou Reed for electroshock therapy. This was the late 1950s, and there was a theory that homosexuality could be cured with the right treatment. And back then, the right treatment was sending electricity through your brain. Now, Lou really wasn't gay. Bisexual is probably a better description. And David Bowie really wasn't gay. That was that publicity stunt. But Jobriath was. Now, you're probably thinking, what? Who? Jobriath? Yes. The first openly and genuinely gay rock star. His real name was Bruce Campbell, and he was a former member of a forgotten California band called Pigeon. And then he got into musical theater, performing in productions of Hair. He was also a part-time drug addict and occasional rent boy. That didn't stop a manager by the name of Jerry Brandt from striking a deal with Electra Records for $500,000. 
Joe Bryant's debut album was recorded with help from Peter Frampton and John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin. And to launch the record, Elektra paid to have a $200,000 billboard of a nearly nude Jabriath posted right in the middle of Times Square. Full-page ads appeared in the New York Times and Rolling Stone and Vogue and even Penthouse. Another $200,000 was also spent on a stage production that was supposed to open at the Paris Opera House. Props included a 40-foot model of the Empire State Building designed to uh, look like, uh, uh, well, you know... And in interviews, Joe Bryant referred to himself as, quote, a true fairy. But then it all came crashing down. The Paris shows never happened. And after two albums, Joe Bryant disappeared. He bounced between L.A. and New York, not really doing much of anything, including music, because of this ironclad 10-year contract he had with Jerry Brandt. And they were not talking. In fact, they were fighting. By the early 80s, his bathhouse habits caught up with him, and Joe Bryant contracted AIDS. He died on August 3rd, 1987, and it's only now, thanks mostly to a contingent of fans who discovered him after his death, a contingent that included Morrissey, by the way, that Joe Bryant is being acknowledged for his contributions to music. Would you like to hear some? Okay, this is a sample of his first album, a self-titled release from 1973. This is Joe Bryant and Take Me, I'm Yours. Joe Bryant, the world's first openly gay and genuinely gay rock star. There were other musicians singing about gayness. There was a British folk rock group called Everyone Involved who sang a few pro-gay songs as early as 1972. Chris Robeson released a song in 1973 called Looking for a Boy Tonight. In 1975, there was a German band called Flying Lesbians. Steve Grossman was an openly gay folk blues singer who was around in the 1970s. 1978 marked the founding of the San Francisco Gay Lesbian Freedom Band, which billed itself as the first openly gay musical organization in the world. Still, most of this music was safely closeted away from mainstream eyes and ears. It took a special kind of revolution to open things up. How punk rock helped gay rock in seconds. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. 
This is the ongoing history of new music. One of the great things about the original punk rock era of the 1970s was the concept that music belonged to everyone and that anyone should be able to make music. Things like age and background and gender and ability didn't matter. If you had something to say with music, then damn it, you should be able to say it. Pete Shelley was a fan of the Sex Pistols and leader of the Buzzcocks. As a bisexual, he loved that he was able to write and sing about anything he wanted. Well, you've tried it just for once, find it all right for kicks. But now you find out that it's a habit that sticks and you're an orgasm addict. You're an orgasm addict. Sneaking in the back door with daddy might seem. So your mother wants to know what all the stains on the jeans. And you're an orgasm addict. You're an orgasm addict. But you're still keeping me there and you meet to pulp and you're an orgasm addict. You're an orgasm addict. You're a kicker to know that you're a no-chose epitaph. Live on a fucking yourself to death. Orgasm addict. You're an orgasm addict. She's assistants and bell hops. You brought them all here and there. Children of God and the joy strings. International women with nobody has. Orgasm Addict from the Buzzcocks. Short little punk ditty, highly influential in the 1970s. There were plenty of punk performers who enjoyed the sexual liberation of the 1970s. Tom Robinson, we already talked about him. He was sent to a special home for maladjusted boys when he was a teenager. He was able to come out finally. There were the New York Dolls, the first group to wear makeup and spandex on stage. There was Wayne County, the New York punk scene fixture who went all the way and was surgically altered to become... Jane County. And it wasn't in just the big cities. Down in Athens, Georgia, a new group called the B-52s were starting to attract attention. The singer, a guy named Fred Schneider, was gay, and so was guitarist Ricky Wilson. And then there were popular one-hit wonders like this. This is Elton Motello and Jet Boy, Jet Girl. Can you tell what's on my mind? She with him, it drives me wild. I like to hit him on the head until he's dead. The sight of blood is such a high. Ooh, 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 ooh. He gives me head. We made it on a ballroom blitz. I took his arm and kissed his lips. He looked at me with such a smile. My face turned red. We booked a room into the Ritz. Ooh, 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 ooh. He gives me head. Jet boy, jet girl Gonna take you around the world Jet boy, I'm gonna make and penetrate I'm gonna make you be a girl Ooh, 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 ooh Jet boy, jet girl And though I'm only just 15 I like to kick, I like to scream And even if I have a kick or two in bed When I'm with him, it's just a dream me head, head. Jet boy, jet girl, gonna take you around the world. Jet boy, I'm gonna make them penetrate. I'm gonna make you be a girl. Ooh, 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 ooh. Jet boy, jet girl. The other day, what a surprise. I saw him with some other guys. 
God, he was dressed up with a girl around his neck. I could have cried with both my eyes. Ooh, 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 ooh. He gave me head. My brain is stuck on glue And when the world tries to forget all that I said I still remember you Jet Boy, Jet Girl, originally done by Elton Motello and covered by other punk and new wave bands around the world. Some were gay, well, others just liked it for the shock value. Let's talk about the relationship between rock and sex for a second. From the beginning, rock has essentially been sex and rebellion set to music. Punk became the antidote to the preening and swaggering of mainstream rock of the 1970s. And then in the late 70s, we saw something called New Wave, the descendant of punk that also embraced the idea of anything goes. And also, it took on its own sense of theater. The goal was still to shake people up, but instead of using aggression and violence and leather jackets with safety pins and swastikas, the tools were with costuming and makeup and expressions of sexuality. A lot of new wave bands took a lesson from the campy gay elements of disco. Literally hundreds of technopop bands adopted effeminate, or at least androgynous, looks. Some of these performers, such as Boy George, were in fact gay. Others, like Depeche Mode, were presumed to be gay, at least at first, thanks to the clothes and the hair and the makeup. Many fans found these new attitudes to be refreshing and liberating. Others found it disgusting, especially among some of the hardline rock fans who found it very hard to stomach those fags with synthesizers. Despite those attitudes, though, gay-oriented music continued to filter into the mainstream. One of the first openly gay alt-rock role models in the world was a woman, and a Canadian. Carol Pope fronted Rough Trade, a Toronto group whose very name was a term from gay culture. Carol was extremely upfront and extremely suggestive when it came to sex. It was like, yeah, I've got different ideas about sex. You, you want to make something of it? What made Carol even more interesting was the fact that she was making these statements and having mainstream success in dull, boring, polite, conservative Canada. She's a cool...
Rough Trade and High School Confidential, a highly controversial song when it came out in 1980. For many people in Canada, Carol Pope made a serious impression, not just with her music, but the fact that she was, well, here was a woman who was totally upfront about not just sexuality, but the fact that she was a lesbian. Another very important band of the era was from Liverpool, a band called Frankie Goes to Hollywood. All the members of the band were openly gay and very in-your-face about it, complete with all the stories of drugs and anonymous bathhouse sex. And in 1984, this song had everybody talking, especially after it was banned by the BBC for obscene homoerotic overtones.
Frankie goes to Hollywood and relax. A major worldwide hit in 1984 and another major milestone in the history of gay new rock. And there was more to come from both men and women. More in just a moment. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. This is the ongoing history of new music. Another group that contributed to the catalog of gay new rock was the Smiths. When the group first got together in 1982, the original plans were to give the band a complete and total gay image. The Smiths were going to be a gay band. In fact, the first single they planned to release was a cover of a song by a girl band of the 1960s called The Cookies. And the name of the song? A 1963 release called I Want a Boy for My Birthday. Morrissey's lyrics were often of a highly sensitive nature. Some would characterize them as feminine. When the Smiths started playing live gigs, they were often joined on stage by a male go-go dancer. And then there's the matter of the artwork on the Smiths' albums and singles. Many of them were of gay figures in the world of art and film. For example, the person on the cover of the Smiths' debut album is Joe D'Alessandro, a gay porn actor. But was anyone in the band really gay? Well, given the family histories of everyone else, the only possibility is Morrissey himself. But he has never confirmed or denied any aspect of his sexuality. However, he has professed great admiration for the aforementioned Jobriath. He was also a big fan of the New York Dolls, the campy, effeminate pre-punk group from New York that turned a lot of heads in the early 1970s. Oscar Wilde, the gay English playwright, major influence on Morrissey. Others maintain, though, that Morrissey is completely celibate, or maybe totally asexual. This could explain why he has never, ever been linked with any kind of a partner. Here's a quote from 1984. I refuse to recognize the terms hetero, bi, and homosexual. Everyone has exactly the same sexual needs. People are just sexual. The prefix is immaterial. Whatever the case, there is no mistaking the impact that Morrissey and the Smiths have had. The Smiths, contributor to the culture of gay new rock, intentional or not. Smith's This Charming Man from 1984. 
When we come back, I'll look ahead to the second half of this program. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. This is the ongoing history of new music. On the second half of this program, we'll pick things up with the middle 1980s, with groundbreaking gay groups like the Bronsky Beat, and then move towards the present to investigate the contributions to gay culture made by some very liberal-minded grunge groups. Grunge groups? Yes, you bet. And let's not forget about the Riot Girls, or modern-day punks and singer-songwriters. You may be surprised by what you hear. Part two of our history of gay new rock, next time in the ongoing history of new music. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to The Ongoing History of New Music, a Deep Sky production.